The shoots, leaves, and roots of the cattail plant can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a crunchy texture and a slightly sweet flavor. To Native Americans, cattail was a cornucopia. Uh, remember the the um, the cone thing that we use for Thanksgiving, uh, where it's a, a horn of plenty. Well, this is what they uh, the Native Americans thought of the cattail uh, because it provided food, medicine, and clothing to anyone inventive enough to utilize its resources. Tonight, I'm kind of looking at edible herbs, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the medicinal benefit, but more so on the side of, can you go out there and eat them? And you can, there's a lot of herbs that God's put out there that we can eat and it can sustain life. And so we're gonna talk about a few of them tonight. Definitely, it's not conclusive. Also, I'm gonna talk about some in preparation, not exhaustively, and also one person may fix it different than another person. So it's definitely, there's many ways to prepare herbs, especially the ones that may be a little toxic that you have to prepare a certain way. So they're no longer toxic. There's different ways of doing it. So I'll cover one way and y'all can explore. So let's take a look, let's jump into it. It's easy for me to, to jump into the medicinal side, but I'm gonna try to stay more into the nutrition side tonight. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the medicinal also. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is acorns. Acorns come from oak trees, and they were an important food source for many indigenous people. Uh, they can be eaten raw, roasted, um, or ground into a flour after being processed. And I looked at doing going to the major process. It's a long process, so take a look at it. If you want to use acorns, it's a great source for y'all to use for a number of different types of, of foods. And uh, the acorns are very nutritional uh, for you to eat. And they're in abundance. And again, it comes from an oak tree. Uh, amaranth. Amaranth is a nutritious grain that can be cooked and eaten like rice. It is high in protein and vitamins, and it has a nutty flavor. Amaranth leaves are a storehouse for many phytonutrients, antioxidants, minerals, vitamins, and contributes immensely to health and wellness. Its greens carry just uh, uh, 23 calories. Amaranth leaves contain only traces of fats and no cholesterol. And again, when you look at cholesterol, if you wanna figure out if something has cholesterol or not, if it has a mama, it has cholesterol. So if it comes from a, an animal, if it comes from, uh, from dairy, it will have cholesterol. Now, that's the first thing key you want to look at. So obviously amaranth doesn't come from an animal, doesn't come from a uh, uh, dairy, so it's not going to have cholesterol. But there are two more things that can affect cholesterol, and that is cashews can uh, lower the HDL, thus the cholesterol can go up. And then we know from the North American wheat, according to Dr. William Davis, a cardiologist, the North American wheat has 42 chromosomes, can raise HD, uh, the LDL, the LDL. But mostly, uh, if you're looking at a plant product, you don't have to worry about cholesterol. The leaves and stems carry a good amount of soluble and insoluble dairy fibers. For the same reason, amaranth greens are often recommended by dietitians in the cholesterol controlling and weight reduction programs. Uh, fresh 100 grams of amaranth leaves contains 29% of the dietary reference index of iron. So it's a good source of iron. And it's interesting, you know, we're seeing more and more uh, issues of iron being a, a problem with uh, restless leg syndrome or muscle cramps. Uh, three, the four big ones out there are uh, number one is magnesium, 75% of leg cramps and uh, muscle pain is due to magnesium deficiency. Number two is dehydration. Number three is potassium. And number four is iron. And I'm seeing more and more iron deficiency. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's an ER physician. And he said, Walt, I'm seeing more and more iron deficiency. And I, what do you think it is, I asked. He said, Walt, it's simple. People are eating fast food. They're not eating green leafy vegetables. 
And that's where we get a bulk of our iron. And so it's he's exactly right. And so if you want to get your iron, get it from your green leafy vegetables. And here we're looking at amaranth or your, your greens out in the forest. You're going to have some iron in those. Good chance. Fresh amaranth leaves are one of the richest sources of vitamin C. 100 grams of fresh leaves carries 43.3 uh, uh, milligrams of vitamin C. Amaranth has several vital antioxidants vitamins, vitamins like vitamin A, lutein, and lutein is good for our eyes. Zeaxanthine, that's also good for our eyes. B carotene. Amaranth greens perhaps have the highest concentrations of vitamin K of all edible green leafy vegetables. 100 grams of fresh greens provides 1,140 uh, UGs of, uh, or 950% uh, of the daily requirement of vitamin K. Amaranth greens also contain ample amounts of B-complex vitamins, such as folate, B6, riboflavin, thiamine, and niacin. And B B your B vitamins are so important. When we're stressed, we dump B vitamins. And uh, you know, when we go into fight or flight, and we try to get that from our foods as much as possible. And because stress is the number one diagnosis in America, which according to WHO, we're, we sh we're probably going to see depression surpass that uh, right shortly. But Right now, stress is the major one, and definitely stress exacerbates um, depression. But um, the B vitamins are so important because we're dumping them all the time. So look for foods that you can get your B vitamins. Moreover, its leaves carry more potassium than that of spinach. And again, one of the major causes of those leg cramps is a potassium deficiency. So here's another uh, good source of amaranth. Additionally, it has higher levels than uh, other minerals than uh, spinach, such as calcium, manganese, magnesium, copper, and zinc. So some really good nutrition here in, in this product. Now, elderberry. A lot of people over the years have heard about elderberry. Uh, we know that Mrs. White used to actually plant elderberries uh, near her home. Uh, they're a great source for uh, our immune system. And uh, we saw that a lot during COVID. The berries of American elderberry have been eaten raw, cooked, or made into jam. They're high in vitamins and antioxidants. So you can eat the berries. Uh, you, can, you can freeze them. A lot of ladies in our area here in Appalachia, they'll put them up. They'll freeze them. They'll put them in little Ziploc baggies. And then they can bring them out, use them for whatever they want to use them for later. Kind of like putting up blueberries or blackberries. But also they'll use them, they'll pull them out and they'll make teas in the wintertime if, uh, you know, their grandchild or, or any of the family are sick. Research published in the Journal of Internal uh, uh, International Medical Research suggests that when it's used within the first 48 hours of onset of symptoms, the plant can relieve and shorten the duration of colds and flus. And I think that's very important for us to take a look at, just as like Tamiflu. Uh, it's not going to work very well after 48 hours. Even the natural things, you want to use that in that incipient stage. And you've heard me talk about incipient stage if we talked on other programs like the herb cabinet. And I encourage you, if you don't have the herb cabinet, call AD, Amazing Discoveries, and, and check out that, uh, that series. But you want to catch a problem in that incipient stage. And here we find with elderberries, if we can catch it in that first 48 hours, better yet, as soon as you start feeling something, start that elderberry uh, or that oil of oregano or oil of oregano or the vitamin C or the or the um, whatever you're choosing to build the immune system. That first 48 hours is critical. After the first 48 hours, even the natural things just do not work as well. And people will wait until after they'll get into day three, day four and say, well, I'll try some natural things. And then it doesn't work well. They waited too long. It's kind of like sin. You need to catch it in the, as Barney said, nip it in the bud. Other identified health benefits, reduces sinus infection symptoms, lowers blood sugar, acts as a natural diuretic, promotes regularity. And we see a lot of that issue out there. Folks don't have natural regularity. Well, a lot of it's because they don't drink water. They eat processed foods 
and they, they don't exercise, they don't eat at the same time, they ignore needing to go to the bathroom. And so we see regular, regulatory issues, uh, regularity issues. Uh, support skin health, eases allergies, uh, could have cancer fighting effects. Well, it's building the immune system. And so it's, it's good for uh, fighting cancer. May improve heart health. So it is good for cardio. Then bamboo. How many of y'all have ever had bamboo growing? Um, one of the things, if you do ever have bamboo and you got snow on it and it's leaning down, don't try to cut it with a chainsaw. It just doesn't, it's not a good thing. It, it, you'll splinter and have all kinds of problems. Um, but bamboo is great to grow, but we can also eat it. Bamboo shoots can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a crunchy texture and a slightly sweet flavor. Other identified health benefits, they lower the LDL, the bad cholesterol. Bamboo shoots are packed with vitamins and minerals, potassium, calcium, manganese, zinc, chromium, copper. Iron, thiamine, niacin, vitamin A, and B6, and then vitamin E. That's a lot. That is packed full of, that, there's a multivitamin right there, y'all. Blackberries. You know, don't just put, you know, tomatoes, potatoes, you know, corn, whatever in your garden. Have an herb garden that can grow throughout the year that if you're not able to grow the vegetables, here's these other foods. Now, obviously the blackberries, uh, we grow blackberries at home. My daughter grows blackberries and this is a simple one, but let's say you've got other things. Let's say you grow some bamboo, uh, you grow uh, some amaranth, you grow some poke, you grow you know, these other herbs that aren't normally in the garden, grow them like granddad did. And you have those herbs, whether they're for food, or they're for medicinal benefits. So blackberries. Blackberries can be eaten raw, cooked, or made in jam. And this is kind of a no-brainer to most of us because we're used to eating blackberries, but blackberries are wild and they're out in the, in the woods. They are high in vitamins and antioxidants. Top, they're top, in the top 10 of auric value. And the auric value is what we use for the, you know, that immune system. Uh, they're in the top 10. They're a good source of vitamin C, manganese, vitamin K, uh, that can prevent and slow the growth of cancer, improves and maintains brain function. So I know a lot of people, including myself, we need to be eating some blackberries. Reduces inflammation. You know, inflammation is good. We need to have the right amount of inflammation, but a lot of people have too much inflammation. And here, you're, if you're looking for an anti-inflammatory, blackberries are a good source. Fights infection, boosts the immune system, protects against stomach ulcers. It's antibacterial, so it kill bacteria. Uh, regulates menstrual health. Good for the cardiovascular system. Promotes healthy skin. Blueberries, and again, most of us are familiar with blueberries. Blueberries can be eaten raw, cooked, made into jam. Uh, and if you look at jams, making jams, you don't have to use the the white, the, the processed sugar. We use jams that have white grape juice as the sweetener. So it's a lot better. They're high in vitamins and antioxidants. One of the best things that you can use for Alzheimer's disease, and I might talk about it here, but let me go ahead and, and share it with you, is blueberries. They did a study with mice. And uh, they, you know, mice will live um, uh, two years. And so they, they took a, a base group of mice and, uh, and they gave them just mice food. And as they, they did well in the maze in their, geri in, their, in their young age, but as they got into geriatric age, they started having problems going through the maze. Then they took another group. That was a control group. The other group, they fed them blueberries every day. And that group, in their adolescent years, they did well through the maze. But even into the geriatric years, they did just as well as the adolescents. And they found all of them did. And the difference was eating blueberries. We've actually seen with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's actually improve, not just stop, but actually have improvement by using blueberries. 
It's a great antioxidant, works very, very well. Uh, here we go. Beneficial for Alzheimer's, helps to fight cancer, assists with weight loss, uh, boosts brain health. It's anti-inflammatory, supports digestion, promotes heart health. The next one is bull thistle. I'm sure if you've been out in the country, you've seen this bull thistle. The leaves, the stems, and flowers of the bull thistle can be eaten raw or they can be cooked. Again, the leaves, the stems, or the flowers can be cooked or eaten raw. The bull thistle generally grows in pastures, gardens, along trails, roadsides, and in waste areas. Be careful of herbs growing in roadsides because you've got the pollution from the admission of the vehicle. They're high in vitamin A, also vitamin C. Aids in digestion, helps stomach cramps. Steam from uh, the warm tea is used to treat muscle stiffness and rheumatism. So you can make a warm tea, make the steam, and it can help for muscle stiffness and rheumatism. The leaves are used to treat neuralgia. The fresh flowers are chewed to cover uh, the medicinal uh, medicinal taste. So it can uh, you can you'll probably find that a lot of the these items that I mentioned today may not be something you think of, of when you're eating a bunch of fruit that sweet taste. Some of them are a little on the bitter side. When you cook them, a lot of times the bitterness diminishes. Burdock. Now, burdock is something that grows very well here in, well here in Appalachia. The leaves are uh, edible when they are very small. They're an e easy to identify in the spring. They tend to be bitter, but less when they're small. And we find that of uh, the other leaves, such as poke and uh, uh, some of your lettuces, like your branch, uh, branch, branch lettuce. We say branch, but the branch lettuce it grows in the in the creeks, which we call a branch. And uh, they're a lot um, sweeter when they're tender like that. Large burdock leaves are used to wrap food for campfire cooking. And so if you're cooking your food and you want to keep it out of the fire, you can take the large leaves, wrap it in it, and, and cook it in there. While they may not be uh, tasty alone, uh, they're technically edible, not toxic and won't contribute much uh, flavor to the foods that are being wrapped around. This will keep things clean and neat during the cooking and allow you to cook with minimal equipment. Again, that's the large leaves of the burdock. The roots of the burdock plant can be boiled, roasted. They have a starchy flavor or, and high in carbohydrates. It's a blood purifier and it loves to, it, it's great to kill cancer cells. And you'll find as you look at herbs, your herbs that are blood purifiers, a lot of times kill cancer. And cancer killers, you look, well, it's actually a blood purifier. And so it kind of runs together. Burdock roots are used for many medicinal needs. Cattails. Now, growing up in the South, we've seen a lot of cattails. Um, we used to take them and, uh, and soak them in, um, in a, um, a, a, a lantern fuel and uh, would burn them as a torch when I was a kid. Uh, cattails are great. Just don't take them inside and put them store somewhere uh, because they will open up. And I tell you, it is a mess when it goes and poof, it's like a dandelion when you blow it, but many times more, uh, it will make a huge mess. Don't take a dandelion, that, you know, that brown part there of the dandelion, take it in the house and think you're going to store that thing. You will have a mess. The shoots, leaves, and roots of the cattail plant can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a crunchy texture and a slightly sweet flavor. To Native Americans, cattail was a cornucopia. Uh, remember the, the, um, the cone thing that we use for Thanksgiving uh, where it's a, a horn of plenty? Well, this is what they, uh, the Native Americans thought of the cattail uh, because it provided food, medicine, and clothing to anyone uh, inventive enough to utilize its uh, resources. Cattail's pollen is, uh, is with low toxicity. Although there are no obvious side effects about this herb, pregnant women should stay away from it since it can cause contractions of the uterus. Uh, contraction of the uterus. In some individuals, it may lead to stomach upset 
and loss of appetite also. And that's important. When you look at using herbs and you're dealing with pregnancy or you're dealing with uh, a lady nursing, just double check and make sure it's not going to cause a problem. And a great resource to use, a great resource to use. We talked it about it on the herb cabinet and, and probably also on Old Mountain Remedies. And that is the PDR. Let me pull it down here for y'all. And that is the PDR for herbal medicine, a great tool for y'all to use. And it will tell you whether or not uh, someone who's pregnant or nursing can use that herb because you definitely don't want uh, my daughter right now, Ashley, she's uh, about ready to have a baby. We don't need those contractions starting too early. And so you wouldn't want her to using cattail because we don't need that baby coming right yet. We can wait another week on this. Um, or if you're nursing, one of the problems, it can dry the mother up, some herbs. Some help to produce more milk, but some may dry her up. So be careful on those areas. Chickweed. The leaves and stems of the chickweed plant can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a mild and slightly sweet flavor and are high in vitamin A and vitamin C. Unlike some other nutrition-dense plants, such as dandelion or mustard greens, Chickweed is described as having a pleasant and mild taste, where a lot of those others we talked about can be a little more uh, bitter. Chickweed leaves can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a slightly sweet, neutral taste, almost like spinach or lettuce. For that reason, this versatile edible can be used in many different dishes. The easiest way to consume these leaves are to toss them into a bowl of salad or to add them into sandwiches. However, you can also find a plethora of other, of other recipes from sauces like pesto to chickweed pie. One of the biggest things that I use chickweed for that people come to me for chickweed is it can suppress the appetite. And so if you have a person who's having challenges, say, you know, developing that no muscle in the brain to say no to appetite, they'll take chickweed and it just takes that craving uh, for food away. You know, I just thought of an herb and talking a uh, plant here uh, that I did not bring here, but let me bring it in if you don't mind. And that is now y'all who live in the South or y'all who may be over in Asia, uh, that is kudzu, or as they say in, in Asia, kudzu. Kudzu grows everywhere. I mean, it grows everywhere down here in the South. It actually grows the best in the world in the Southeast United States. Now, kudzu it actually in the summertime can grow as much as one foot a day. Kudzu um, is a nuisance. Most people want to run away from it because it just grows so crazy and takes over homes and takes over uh, I, my fire station too. Number station two, I have kudzu that grows near it. And literally we have to go through routinely in the summertime and cut the because it will overtake the fire station and actually grow over the fire station. We have to keep it cut back. But kudzu is you can eat it. And it's fine for me that folks aren't eating it because it's going to leave plenty for my family. And that distal one foot that grew that, that last 24 hours, uh, the leaves can be picked off and can be cooked like spinach. It can be, Mary Lou's made, uh, she's made uh, kudzu lasagna before instead of spinach lasagna. It's kudzu lasagna. Doesn't taste as good as spinach lasagna, but it's food and it's got a lot of nutrition. It's packed full of nutrients. See, kudzu grows 30 to 50 feet deep. Very, very nutritious. Um, you can take that, that, the, um, that stem and you can scrape off that outer part in that last foot. That last foot is the most tender that you can work with. Scrape off that outer part and, and the Chinese will put it into a, um, put a bunch of them into a, a bucket, a, a pot of boiling water, and it will actually make noodles. And so you can add something else to it, but that's a noodle. And, and it has some nutrition. You can take the root and you can put it in water and cook it like a potato. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a, um, a missionary over in China. And he said, when a Chinese lady gets up in the morning, she will start a pot of water boiling. When it starts to boil, when it comes to a boil, she'll throw a chicken in there and she'll throw kudzu root in there. And that's the food. And nutrients are coming out of that kudzu root into that 
into that water for that chicken soup. But medicinally, um, we use it for, um, uh, it actually helps with weight loss, very similar to chickweed. Uh, it helps with weight loss. Chickweed is more of an appetite suppressant. The, um, the kudzu actually just helps you lose weight faster. Another thing that I sell it the most for, and that is for ladies, they'll come and buy it whose husband uses alcohol. They'll buy a bottle of, of kudzu capsules and a bottle of, uh, um, of multivitamins. They'll pour out the multivitamins and they'll use those, but they fill the multivitamin container with kudzu capsules. Then they give it to their husband and say, husband, here's your multivitamin. It actually suppresses or... Um, we see research shows a 40 to 60 percent reduction in craving for alcohol. So we see uh, people just plum quit or significantly quit, uh, you know, cut back on the use of alcohol. In China, in China, if they can't figure out how to fix something, like if I can't pick at, you figure out how to help somebody else, and, and I've worked and worked and worked. One of the best things that I have found to reset the button on health is juice. Juice is amazing for resetting health issues. In China, if they can't figure out what to do for you, those doctors will make kudzu gruel. And what they do is they take kudzu root, and literally kudzu root can grow as big as a small person. Again, it's growing 30 to 50 feet deep. And they'll take the kudzu root, and they will um, they'll dry it, then they'll pound it to a powder, then they'll make a gruel and they will um, feed that person a cup of kudzu gruel every meal for 30 days. That's all they eat. And I've read reports where they cured uh, gonorrhea, tuberculosis, many diseases that they weren't able to just fix it. And they use the kudzu and the kudzu provides the body new, a lot of nutrition and the body's able to overcome. So kudzu, I didn't put it here. But look up kudzu, y'all. If you're ever going to live in the South or somewhere that kudzu grows, that's going to be some food for you someday. Don't, uh, I'm serious. Chickweed is high in antioxidants, uh, saponines, vitamin C and A, and a number of other uh, anti-inflammatory compounds. Okay, chicory. Now, a lot of folks know about chicory. They've used it as a coffee substitute. The roots of chicory plant can be boiled or roasted. They have a starchy flavor and are high in carbohydrates. Chicory is an incredible versatile plant with a slightly bitter taste, and there are tons of different ways to eat it. Although most people roast the root to grind uh, for a coffee-like drink, you can also eat the leaves cooked or raw. Raw leaves add a spicy or peppery taste to salads, while cooking the leaves brings out their bittersweet flavor. Dandelion. I've had so many people come in over the years, and when I tell them that they need to use dandelion, they'll tell me, I've tried for years to rid my garden, to rid my yard of dandelions, and now you're telling me I need dandelions and I need to pay you for dandelions? Well, leave the dandelions in your yard. I know a lady up in the, here in the mountains of Appalachia, and um, you know, when, back years ago, I remember when they were having some tough financial times raising their kids, and the mother would send her kids out to pick dandelions, and that was their greens. That was their greens for the salad or to cook, and that was their food. And they went out there, and they would pick dandelion leaves to bring in. Well, dandelion leaves, stems, and roots of the dandelion plant can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a bitter flavor and are high in vitamin A and vitamin C. Roots are typically harvested in the fall and early winter when they are considered most medicinally potent. So again, if you're collecting those roots, I like the roots, then the dandelion root for liver issues and for kidney issues. That's where I'm using the dandelion root. It's also a good diuretic, but uh, if you want it the top medicinal, it's kind of like, when do you pick watermelons? Are you going to pick water, watermelons, you know, in the wintertime, if you could get them to grow? No, you're going to pick watermelons in July and August, uh, that time of the year that they grow the best. Well, the most nutrition, just like when you're cutting hay, there's a certain point, and then that bell curve goes the other way. 
your dandelion root has the most nutrition. And the most nutrition is going to be when? What's it say here? In the fall or early winter, you're going to have the most nutrition in those roots. Collect those roots, dry them out. You can use it medicinally or you can uh, you know, use it for other things here. Uh, let's see here. Um, but they say they have a better flavor in the spring. So if you're looking at eating, you can um, eat and pick them in the spring, but they're going to be more medicinal in the uh, in the early fall, in the fall or early winter. Dandelion greens are a great addition to smoothies. The greens are often put in salads, but also can be cooked as greens. So let's say you're going to cook some greens up. Just go out there and pick the dandelions. Dandelion is high in vitamin A, vitamin C, calcium, iron, magnesium, potassium. Let's go back here a moment. On dandelions, the leaf, I like using the leaf for um, congestive heart failure. If they're having a lot of, um, of um, congestion in the lungs, if they're wanting to use Lasix or a diuretic to get rid of that congestion in the lungs with CHF, dandelion leaf is the best for that actually works better than the regular diuretic and let's say they're having some edema down in the lower uh, extremities or in the feet again dandelion leaf is amazing for getting rid of that edema or if you're just needing good diuretic the dandelions are also good for there you know if you'll forgive me i'd like to bring in another herb here that i've just came to me that i just didn't have time to put in here and i'm going to still have problems but i really believe it's important And that is stinging nettle, stinging nettle. And as I was thinking about this lady here in the mountains collecting it, next month I'll be up in Middle River, uh, Minnesota speaking. I go up there every year with those folks up in Middle River. Great people up there, tremendous. And we used to get a lot of folks down from Canada uh, before we started having the borders close there. Hopefully they'll come down this year. Um, but the ladies up in Northern Minnesota and Northern Wisconsin, when I go to Wisconsin, They'll go out and they'll pick a stinging nettle and they will, it will they'll wear gloves and then they'll cook it and they'll cook it like, like greens. And uh, it's, it's, again, it's free. So when you're looking at being out in the country and let's say that you don't have uh, the, um, the food that you need because, you know, finances are bad or no buy, no sell or whatever's going on. Stinging nettle is a great source for you. It's a great medicinal tool, but it's a great nutritional tool also. So as you look at the dandelions, once it's cooked or once it's dried, it's not going to sting. And uh, so that's another herb that you can let grow wild out on your property. And again, it grows from Florida all the way up to Minnesota, northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin. So it can take a huge wide scope of a uh, uh, different um, weathers. From a medicinal standpoint, um, stinging nettle is considered the most nutritious of all North American herbs. Did you get that? Stinging nettle is now considered probably the most nutritional uh, North American herbs. It's packed with calcium and all kinds of vitamins. So you're getting a lot of nutrition when those ladies up in uh, Middle River and up in those areas in Minnesota in Wisconsin are, uh, are cooking that uh, to put for their husbands and their kids and grandkids. You can use stinging nettle. It's also good for, uh, as, for asthma, for like if a person has allergies. Great for female hormones. I like using it. I sell a lot of it for ladies for uh, menopause issues. And it's great for the adrenals. If you got blown adrenals because of stress, dandelion, I'm sorry, uh, stinging nettle is excellent. Now in Asia, don't have an asthmatic attack in Asia because here's what they'll do to you. They will strip you from the waist up, man or woman, they'll strip you plumb naked from the waist up. And then they take stinging nettle and they're going to whoop your chest. They're going to whoop your back. And that will take you out of that asthmatic attack so you can breathe again. Then after that, you can start breathing. They will put mud all over your chest and all over your back. And uh, that will then pull that stinging out. But stinging nettle is an excellent tool to have out in your woods for when your family needs food. Daylily. 
The buds, flowers, and leaves of the daylily plant can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a crunchy texture and a slightly sweet flavor. It's rich in pollen, sugar, protein, calcium, fat, carotene, amino acids, and other essential nutrients for the human body. Daylily is a rich dietary fiber and a ver variety of vitamins and minerals. When dried, the daily, listen to this y'all, when dried, the daylily contains 10 times more protein, fat, and carbohydrates than a tomato and Chinese cabbage. So it's an excellent uh, source of protein here. You can eat them raw. One can uh, harvest a small shoots that begin to grow in the early spring, cut them off at the soil before they reach eight inches tall. Any taller, they become fibrous and tough. Who has grown okra? Y'all know that when okra is this long, it's just not good. When okra is this long, it's going to be too fibrous. Perfect okra. Perfect okra is this right here. That's where you're going to, oh, okra is delicious. Just go out there and pick it off and eat it raw. Uh, you can bake it in the oven. Uh, now, I don't like it boiled. It's slimy. It's like an old slug going across the plate. But okra is perfect here. If it's like this, it's too long. The same thing here with the daylily. If it's uh, if you want to cut it off before it reaches eight inches uh, or it gets very fibrous and tough, just like the okra will. Cut off the outer leaves and eat the tender inner portion. One can eat daylily shoots raw on their own or dip them into a veggie dip to give them more flavor. Wild grapes. Now, most of us know how to eat grapes and what grapes are good for. There's muscadines. There's, I mean, all kinds of grapes that grow in the wild. The grape can be eaten raw. They have a sweet flavor and high in sugars. Wild grapes are good sources of B1, B6, vitamin C, as well as manganese, potassium. They're also excellent source of antioxidants. Wild grapes can be enjoyed fresh, directly from the plant, or can be used in cooked applications. One can also enjoy them along with other fruits and salads. Jerusalem artichokes. The roots of Jerusalem artichoke plant can be boiled or roasted. They have a starchy flavor and are high in carbohydrates. Excellent source of iron. We talked about iron before, where folks just aren't getting enough iron. Copper. Manganese, uh, I'm sorry, magnesium, and magnesium is another one that gets dumped when we're stressed. A lot gets dumped when we're stressed. See, magnesium, when we're stressed, adrenaline goes up. And when the adrenaline goes up, it helps us into fight or flight. But what happens is it can harm our cells. So God puts this fire extinguishing system in that dumps magnesium and it buffers, it protects our cells from the harmful effects of the elevated adrenaline. So if you are in stress all the time, fight or flight all the time, uh, anxiety all the time, you are dumping your magnesium. And this is a good source of magnesium, phosphorus and potassium. Potassium is another one that gets dumped in stress. That's why blood pressure goes up. Cortisol go. I'm sorry, it gets dumped. Yes, cortisol goes up, potassium gets dumped when you're stressed, that causes blood pressure to go up. Here's the source of potassium to keep that potassium up because you've been dumping it because you were stressed. Jerusalem artichokes, or sunchokes, as some people call it, are starchy tubers like potatoes and turnips. When roasted, the skin becomes flaky and the flesh becomes tender, but the taste of the sunchoke or artichoke is slightly nutty and sweet. Cooked sunchokes are the best when eating within two days. So when you pick them, eat it within two days. When uh, raw, they store well in your fridge, uh, a vegetable bin, wrapped loosely in a paper towel. Lamb's quarter. Now, lamb's quarter is something we see here in the South. Uh, we, it, we see it a lot out in cow pastures. Uh, lamb's quarter is not the quarter end of a lamb. Also known as fat hen because it will fatten up hens. Goose foot, pig weed, and also wild spinach. That's lamb's quarter. The leaves, stems, and flowers of the lamb's quarter plant can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a mild, slightly sweet flavor and are high in vitamin A and vitamin C. And we're seeing that quite often here. I, uh, these, these herbs are high in vitamin A and vitamin C. What's that going to help for your immune system? Leaves can be used as wild spinach substitute in salads, stir fry, soups, and casseroles. So what have we talked about using? Uh, like spinach. We've talked about using kudzu. 
we've talked about using um, uh, stinging nettle. A lot of these herbs we can use and we can use it in place of what we're used to, the spinach, and use it for feeding our families. Very important. We don't have to starve out there. Uh, grind the seeds into dark flour to make gruel or bread. So you can actually use the seeds here uh, to make a gruel or a bread. The leaves dry well and can be uh, reconstituted into powder to make flour. The dried leaves make a delicious flour mixed with a bit of water to make a tortilla. Lamb's Quarter has a poisonous look-alike look nettle leaf goosefoot. Now that's not stinging nettle. This is another one called nettle leaf goosefoot. That one's poisonous. Looks a lot like lamb's quarter, but its rank odor reveals its identity. So if it stinks, doesn't smell good, uh, it's not lamb's quarter. Uh, it is the nettle leaf goosefoot. Lamb's quarter is a, rel a relative of spinach. Uh, avoid too much raw consumption of plants with heavy oxalic acid contents. Uh, cooking will destroy some of the oxalic acid, but for salad and smoothie use, use lemon juice to neutralize the oxalic acid and help prevent kidney stones. So if you're eating a lot of lamb's quarter and foods with heavier in oxalic acid and you're eating it raw, just add a little lemon juice and that will help you out prevent kidney stones. Lamb's quarter is high in calcium. It is probably uh, one of the highest, uh, if not the highest green plants or what plants shall I say in calcium. Excellent source of calcium. Yes, the nettle has the good source of calcium, but the lamb's quarter is the highest that I know in calcium. So ladies, if you're looking uh, at osteoporosis, uh, osteopenia, and your doctor's saying, oh, well, you need to take you some calcium. Well, two things to, to think about. One, it's better to use green leafy vegetables for calcium than it is a pill. But if you do use a pill for calcium, make sure if you're taking 1,000 milligrams of calcium, take 500 milligrams of magnesium. Or if you're taking 1,200 milligrams of calcium, take 600 milligrams of, mag of magnesium because whatever that half amount of the calcium is, it's going to take that much to break the calcium down and you'll just rob it from the body. So you need to take those together. But your best source of calcium is your green leafy vegetables. And if you're needing to boost your calcium, ladies, or even men, Lamb's Quarter is an excellent source to get that calcium along with your nettle. Milkweed. Okay, the milkweed, the buds, the flowers, and the leaves of the milkweed plant can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a crunchy texture and slightly sweet flavor. The milkweed is the single most important source of food for the uh, threatened monarch butterfly, and planting a patch or two in your landscape is an important contribution to the continued existence of the species of the, uh, the monarch butterfly. There are three times in the life cycle of the common milkweed uh, plant when uh, you can eat it. The first, when the uh, tender short shoots are just emerging from the ground, when they are shorter than about eight inches and they can be pulled, uh, bite in root and removed and cooked. Uh, the second time you can forage uh, for edible parts is in the budding stage. And the third opportunity is when the buds are very small, less than two inches. The milkweed contains a milky white sap that is considered toxic. Fortunately, the toxins are water soluble and can be easily removed during cooking. For each of these three harvesting times, it is suggested that one, boil the water, add uh, the plant, cook for two to three minutes, then discard the water. We do the same thing for, uh, for poke. Cover uh, with fresh new boiling water, cook for another two to three minutes, discard the water again. Add more fresh boiling water, cook for another two to three minutes, discard the water, and either repeat it again if uh, additional cooking is needed or uh, eat it as is or add to other foods. Same thing with poke. When I'm making poke, I'm doing it three times and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. So what you're doing is you're boiling the water, at, put the plant in, Cook it for about two to three minutes. Then you're going to discard that water. Put in more water. Cook it another, um, uh, boil it for another two to three minutes. Throw that water away. Then the third time you cook it, throw that water away, and now you can eat it. Now, if you don't like the taste, you can do it a few more times. Plantain. 
Now we're not talking the banana looking thing. This is plantain and uh, it's a great source of nutrition. The leaves of plantain plant can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a mild or slightly sweet flavor and are high in vitamin A and vitamin C. Keep seeing that vitamin A and vitamin C popping up. If you're wanting to get vitamin C, if you're wanting to get vitamin A, go out there to the plants, eat you some plants. The broadleaf plantain uh, we, uh, weeds that you find in your yard can be eaten entirely, but the young leaves are the tastiest. And again, we talked to that, about that before. The younger leaves are tastier. Use the leaves raw in any way you wish. Uh, you would use spinach, such as in salads or in sandwiches. You can also use the older leaves raw, but they tend to be more bitter and stringy. Uh, if using the larger leaves raw, consider removing the veins first, kind of like deveining, or cooking the plantain weeds is another option, especially for the larger older leaves. A quick blanch or light stir fry will tone down the bitterness and soften the veins that makes them less stringy and fibrous. You can even blanch the leaves and then freeze them to use later in soups and sauces. Plantain is also good to use uh, topically as a, uh, as a poultice, a very, very popular poultice. Uh, also, it's one of the, uh, it's probably, plantain is probably uh, one, comfrey and plantain are probably the most popular uh, um, a spit poultice. And again, go back to, uh, and I believe poultices we covered in uh, the herb cabinet, Go, go look at the herb cabinet where it talks about poultices and different kinds of poultices. And I talked about spit poultices. That's where you can chew it up in your mouth, spit it out, and then apply it to the area. And uh, it breaks the, the, uh, the uh, cells in it when you chew it up and mixes it with the saliva so it gets wet. And you can use it as a poultice. Plantain and comfort you can use as uh, spit poultices. Early in the season, look for the new shoots of plantain. Uh, these have a, a light asparagus-like flavor, and a quick saute will enhance that taste. Again, that, that young shoot is going to have a little more taste to it. You can even eat the seeds of plantain, but harvesting them is hardly worth the effort as they are tiny. Some people eat the entire shoot of seeds. Once the flowers have finished, these seed pods can be eaten raw or cooked gently. Poke, also known as poke weed, uh, has been used for centuries as food, medicine, dye for clothing, ink, or ink for writing, and much more. I remember my kids when they were little, we had poke growing when we lived over in the mountains of North Carolina. And uh, they'd go out there and they'd get in the poke, run through there, run through the woods and whatever. And they come back with poke stains all over their clothes, all over their arms. And it looked like they were in some Indian war paint stuff. And the, the, um, the poke berry is also very poisonous. Now, in the PDR, again, let me encourage y'all to look at the PDR. It will tell you that you cannot use any poke berries for children. For adults, you can eat up to X amount. And it will clean you out. I remember I have a friend, she's an herbalist, and uh, she just took, she ate too many, and she did. She ate too many. She thought she was going to die, but she said it did the biggest cleaning out of her colon and her sweating, and I mean, her body totally purged, and she felt really good afterwards, but don't put your body through that toxic stage. But uh, poke is a tremendous tool to use uh, medicinally, but it also can be used as food. And, and here in Appalachia, where poke grows so readily, we, we, uh, in the spring, Folks can't wait to have poke salad. And uh, I like using poke for, uh, for cancer. It's tremendous for cancer. Uh, one of my favorite tools for cancer. Uh, I'll take the root. And uh, what I'll do is I'll get a root about the size of my thumb. It grows all over my property, especially in my garden. And uh, I have to actually dig it up to put in my garden. And next year, it's, and, then in the, and then it's growing again, and I've got to dig it up again. My garden grows poke the best of anything. So I'll get a root about this big and uh, I will put it in a quart of water and I'll boil it for 20 minutes. I'll throw that water away, put another quart of water in there and boil it for 20 minutes. Then I'll put another quart of water in there and boil it for, uh, for uh, 20 minutes. That third quart of water that I boiled for 20 minutes, I'll use that as a tea and that person can just sip on that tea throughout the day. 
Then I'll take the root. Let's say we got breast cancer. I'll take that root and I'll grate it on a cheese grater. And, uh, and then it makes, it's like grating cheese. And then I'll take it and I might put, say, uh, a half a teaspoon of psyllium powder with it and put a little bit of, po again, I'll use the tea. I won't add water. I'll use the, uh, the tea. And I'll make me a little like a hamburger patty. And then I'll place that onto where that breast cancer is. When Mary Lou had breast cancer, must have been 14, 15 years ago, poke is some, one of the tools that I used. I had her drinking poke tea, and I, and I was putting poke uh, on her for the, for the breast cancer. And, um, and it works very, very well. Uh, it's a blood purifier, and it kills cancer. In order to transform poke shoots into food for humans, some parts of the plant are toxic. It must first be processed. This is accomplished by the following method. Again, similar to what we just did, but a little bit different. And again, there's different ways of making poke. This is just one preparing the poke. You can go in and, and find all different ways. I just chose one to share with you. Start two pots of water on the stove. Cover one the size to fit the poke that you're going to harvest. And the other one is at least three times the size of the first pot. Coarsely chop up the poke shoots. When water has come uh, to a boil in the small pot and is close to or is boiling in the pot, add poke to the small pot. Stir so that all poke is submerged. Cook for approximately two minutes, the same way as we did before on the, on the other herb or until water returns to a boil. Now when I'm now this is different in eating it versus me making a tea. Remember the tea, how long did I do that? 20 minutes. Here for the food, we're just doing it for two minutes. Place the lid over the small pot in such a way that it stops greens from escaping as you pour off the water or you can use a colander to drain the water. Put beans back into small pot. Pour already boiling water from the big pot over the poke uh, in small pot Cook for approximately two more minutes or until the water returns to a bowl. A bowl. Repeat step four and five one to three more times, depending on the flavor preference. So you've got to do it, um, you know, at least, you know, you're looking here somewhere around, you know, that three, four, five times to get off that poison and then you can eat it for, for food. Okay, let's look here. Anything else on poke uh, to share with y'all? Um, oh, here's something on poke. If poke is dried, if poke is dried, uh, the root, then you don't have to to boil it like the like I do when I pull it fresh out of my yard. Prickly pear. The pads of the cactus can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a crunchy texture and a slightly sweet flavor. Be sure to remove the needles before cooking. That's a good idea. Prickly pear. Cactus uh, has been a staple to the Mexican and Central American diet for thousands of years. Uh, in, part of the, uh, in, in parts of the United States, it's been gaining popularity as an exotic gourmet and healthy addition to one's diet. I was actually somewhere just recently speaking, and I saw some of this cactus. The prickly pear plant has three different edible sections. The pad, of the cactus, which can be treated like a vegetable. The petals of the flower, which can be added to salads. The pear, which uh, can be treated like a fruit. Ramps, that's a great one, y'all. It's another great Appalachian one. Look up ramps. Um, good source of nutrition. It's kind of between a, a, um, a, an onion and a garlic. Uh, actually, it can give you some bad breath. Uh, in some school systems here in the South, uh, if a kid came to school eating ramps, they were kicked out of class for three days because it can give you some bad breath, but ramps are a great tool. The leaves, stems, and roots of ramp plant can be eaten raw or cooked. They have a mild onion flavor and are high in vitamin A and C again. Ramps, commonly called wild leeks, were once limited to growing in the wild, but this springtime vegetable is now being grown in more and more vegetable gardens. They have a flavor that blends spring onions and garlic. Now, a lot of people in my neck of the woods, they will cook it with eggs and meat and whatever. I like just eating ramps cooked by themselves. And um, this just 
it's an Appalachian uh, uh, taste, I guess. Ramps are deliciously eaten on their own, or they can be used to flavor other dishes. The leaves, stems, and bulbs can be blanched, fried, or chopped and mixed into many dishes. Another one out there that we look at is uh, wild onions. And I'm sure you've seen wild onions out there growing. You can smell wild onions and you can pull those up and you can use them as flavoring or you can eat and cook those wild onions. Another one that comes to mind is red clover. Red clover is, uh, is an herb that uh, grows um, out there. And what you, the only part of the red clover you want is just the flower, the purple, the purplish red flower. And uh, you can make a tea of it. Uh, you can just you can eat it. It's great to eat. It tastes good. Uh, so you can put it in your salads as part of the food. It's got a lot of nutrition in it. So you add it to your salads or you can just eat it by itself. You can cook it, put it in with your cooked food or you can make a tea. And I know Mrs. White will end with this one. Mrs. White, you know, she we use the elderberry. She would encourage folks to put elderberry at their homes. Well, actually, she encouraged people to eat the um, the red clover tea every day. Red clover purifies the blood. It's got a lot of nutrients in it. It fights cancer and it kills cancer. It fights cancer and it kills cancer. It's also a phytoestrogen. And so um, uh, red clover is another great tool out there that God's put out there that we can eat, we can make teas, we can use it medicinally, and it's very, very helpful. Oh, let me share one more. Strawberries. Strawberries can be wild, and uh, you can go out there and get wild strawberries. Be careful. There are some things that look like strawberries, and they're poisonous, so know what you're picking. There's all kinds of mushrooms out there, but know what you're picking. And uh, um, um, for that mushroom standpoint, let me give you a caution. I had a lady come in one day, and she had two children in their early 20s that had they weren't from around here and they were visiting and the, the her kids went out there and they picked some mushrooms and they waited about 12 hours and it didn't bother them. And so they thought, oh, they're safe. We can eat them. And they went in, just ate a whole mess of them. They were at the local hospital in the ER. The emergency room doc said, there's nothing we can do. They're going to die. There's nothing. It's poisoned them. The lady rushes over here. All I knew was activated charcoal. I sent it with her. I don't know what happened. I never heard again from them. But mushrooms, if you are testing mushrooms, and it's not good to test mushrooms, know what you're doing. Have someone with you if you're eating mushrooms. They're nutritious and they're very medicinal, but they can kill you. And here's the problem with it. These kids thought they could just eat a little bit of it, wait 12 hours. But many times, wild mushrooms can take 24, 48 hours, as much as 48 hours until it kicks in. And you go, oh, that, that's, that's a problem with that. And so you've got to wait at least 40 hour, 48 hours if testing it. My recommendation is don't test it. Don't take a chance in dying. Uh, find out somebody that knows about mushrooms, and, uh, and they're a whole lot safer. The, uh, back to the strawberry, though. The, the uh, strawberries are great nutritious. We eat strawberries all the time. They grow wild. Make sure it's not the poisonous one, though. But the cap of the strawberry, I was at a seminar one time, and the, uh, the nutritionist for the United Navy Seals was there, and she said that the strawberry cap, that little green cap that we throw in truckloads away when we were capping our strawberries to put them up, that cap has more vitamin C than a strawberry, this nutritionist told us. And she said, if you're making smoothies and you're putting, say, six or eight frozen strawberries in there, leave the caps on or fresh strawberries. Leave the caps on because they're very, very nutritious and you're getting like more than six to eight oranges in there of vitamin C. Well, y'all, uh, we've run out of time here. Uh, I hope it's been beneficial. And God has given us herbs that we can use to medicinally help us but also they're out there to feed your family. Start eating them now. It'll save you money now. I just heard on the news this morning that uh, groceries here in the United States are up 13%. Go out there and start harvesting some of this that God has made us and it's free. And uh, you know, wash it off, make sure it's clean, fix it for your family, get used to fixing it, get used to the taste. So when you are having to be out there and you can't buy and you can't sell, get knowing how to fix it now.
This presentation was filmed at our 2022 camp meeting on site in British Columbia. If you would like to join for the next camp meeting, visit our events page for details events.amazingdiscoveries.org.